Rave to the Grave. Welcome to Rave to the Grave. My guest today is Harry DIY, one of the founding members of the seminal UK raving crew DIY Sound System, who formed in 1989 in Nottingham. Harry and fellow crew members like Diggs and Woosh, Simon DK, and Emma threw some of the most notorious free parties and club nights in and around England throughout the 90s, under the ethos that if you haven't paid, you can't be ripped off. Their collective mindset, fuck-off attitude, and disregard for the rules of the corporate music industry ultimately earned them the moniker the most dangerous people in the UK, and fans the likes of the KLF and Bez. With releases on Warp and their own labels like Strictly for Groovers and DIY Discs, they cemented a druggy, chuggy, jazzy house sound that would travel the world and particularly take hold in San Francisco, where Harry and other DIY members lived for a time. With some speculating about a second summer of love that's going to happen after the pandemic, it seemed like a good time to talk about the first one. Welcome to Rave to the Grave. Harry, welcome to Rave to the Grave. Thank you, Vivian. It's nice to be here <laughs> in my home in Wales, in the UK. <laughs> as, you, as you mentioned in that intro, the, the underlying ethos of DIY, we, we were a collective. Every magazine interview we ever did, every time there was photos, there was a lot. People always wanted one. They said, oh, we don't want to do a collective. We want to do one or two people on the front cover, and we just refused. So um, whether that was wise or not, I don't know. <laughs> But uh, so we were a collective, so we came from all over the place, is the, is the truth. But I guess technically there was four core members of DIY. There was myself, Pete and Rick, who became Diggs and Woosh, Simon DK, and then there was a whole host of other DJs, Emma, Jack, Pip, Cookie, Dick, et cetera, et cetera. But just to keep it simplified, our base became Nottingham, our HQ became Nottingham. But none of us were actually from Nottingham, which is quite funny, really. So Pete and I and Rick grew up in Manchester. Stockport, Bolton, Greater Manchester in the 1980s, well, 70s and 80s. We were all slightly too young for punk. 76 was sort of uh, year zero for punk rock in the UK. I was nine. So my brother was 16. He was into the Sex Bus and the Clash and the Damned and the Ramones, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we missed all that. But I remember going to my first gig, which was the police in Blackburn somewhere, uh, and at whatever age, and just thinking, wow. And I was so small, they stood me on the mixing desk. Uh, my little safety pins in my jacket. And I remember just thinking, the next thing, well, the next thing comes along. I don't understand this. I like it. I like the energy. It's a bit noisy. I like it. The next big thing that comes along, I'm going to be on it. So 10 years later, you know, Acid House came along. So we had rock and roll, didn't we? And then the 60s, late 60s, you know, psychedelic rock. And we had punk rock. And then we had Acid House. Um, but we, I would say, grew up in Manchester north of England in the 80s was just absolutely fucking lucky as anything because I've reflected on it many times. I'm probably biased, but the music in Manchester in the 80s, we started out, you know, we went from Joy Division, we had New Order, we had the Stone Roses, we had the Happy Mondays, we had the Buzzcocks, we had the Smiths. I mean, that right there for me is six of the best 10 bands ever. And so we were lucky. Manchester was post-industrial, grim these days it's very different it's a kind of space age city it was a shithole but much like new york i guess in the 70s it tends to be when somewhere is industrial and you know when somewhere is in decline suddenly all this music emerges so that was our background and then i moved to university of nottingham to study law in 1986 <laughs> fat lot of good that was and uh managed to sort of complete that and i met rick who was from stockport i didn't know him even though we're from 10 miles apart we met and we were both sort of militant vegans and our history was, I'm with Pete, we had an unusual musical lineage. We're onto a narco punk, we're into crass, we're into flux, we're into Fugazi and No Means No and the Pixies and Sonic Youth and all that. We were also heavily into hip hop, Public Enemy and Eric B and Rakim, Stetta Sonic and et cetera, et cetera. We'd been to a lot of free festivals. Uh, there was a big free festival scene in the UK, specifically in the south of England, 70s and 80s, post-hippiedom. 
Avon Free Festival, Stonehenge, big free festival. Went to my first free festival when I was 16 at a little place near Blackburn in the northwest of England. Blew my mind. All my mates went home. I stayed. <laughs> Got told off by my mum. <laughs> and a a harbinger of-, <laughs> of what was to come. <laughs> So, yeah, we, I mean, and we done a lot of amphetamines, we took a lot of acid, we did all that. Uh, and I just think we just were in the right place at the right time. So Nottingham, and you know, most of the way through a book at the moment, and I've done a bit of research, I think that Graham Park in the UK was probably the first person to play house music to a crowd in public in 86, 87 at the garage in Nottingham. So that brings us there. And then Pete basically followed me down. He came to live with us in Nottingham. So around about 88, 89, we all lived in a very chaotic, anarchic, flat, squat house in Nottingham. And we started DIY. Oh, well, we went to an acid house night at Rock City. Uh, and it just changed my life. It was uh, it was just, that was in September 88, age of 21. We just danced for hours. Uh, there were some DJs from London. And what we did, in effect, was we had tried to apply all that history of anarcho bands, punk rock, crass flux, and apply it to dance music. And it seemed completely logical to us at the time. Looking back, it was new, I suppose. So, the, you know, I'm going around, I'm, I'm sort of jumping around a bit here, but hey. So the rave scene, the orbital rave, the word rave didn't really appear in the UK until probably 1990. So when you went to this Acid House night, did you already have mixtapes? Had you already been hearing Acid House? Or was it quite literally like you walk into this club and then you're like, oh my God, this music? It wasn't so much the music. It was the mix. A lot of the music, there's a lot of sort of like uh, Balearic, you know, which is from from Ibiza, you know, thrashing doves and weird stuff. And, you know, it was the fact that it was all mixed together. I think I'd heard, it's hard to remember, I think I'd heard you talked about 32 years ago, but I think I'd heard Acid Tracks by DJ Pierre, I'd heard some some house music, I'd heard like D-Mob, we call it Acid, and if you were Jack, like, for, you know, tracks on the radio, just, I mean, it's funny, because the next day, Rick and I went into Select This with a local record store, so where's the house section, there was three records, four or five records in there. There was no, there wasn't any categories. There was just house. There was like six, five, six records in there. I certainly heard a lot of hip hop by then. We were, Rick and I were hip hop veterans, really. But it, I think it was the fact that it was all mixed together. Before that, I would go to a gig or I'd go to a night and it'd be, there was a gap between the records, wasn't there? You know, it was like, oh, is this track? You'd get up, you'd dance around a bit, sit down, drink a lot. But this was new. It was the fact that there was six, five, six hours of music mixed together seamlessly. And it was just, you know, we took a load of mushrooms, to be honest. Ecstasy hadn't even arrived in Nottingham at that stage, 88. Just to probably arrived a year later. And that was what finished off the deal, really. <laughs> it was the music. It sounded like it was from outer space, but it was just the seamless. So that was the radical thing. And then I guess then Ecstasy appeared for us the next summer in 89. And that was that, really. Do you remember how Ecstasy appeared? And like what the first couple pills were like i do actually so comically i mean we you know we were fairly drug veterans by then at the tender age of 21 but um that was the 80s for you and then little known that the 90s would be even more druggy who knew but yeah i took my first tablet on my 21st birthday in the 22nd birthday november the 23rd 1988 this vegan restaurant it's vegan cafe in Nottingham and they cleared all the stuff it's my birthday and they put some music on nothing happened at all it was one of the most disappointing nights of my life at that point they cut the tablets got 25 pounds let's call that 40 50 dollars the first one was free it was my birthday but the second one cost me 25 quid and I was thinking you know that's a lot of money <laughs> in the 80s and the third the next time we went to a warehouse party Graham Park played and I will never forget this again I'm getting goosebumps even now we all know that well I'm sure most of your listeners know this feeling. 30 minutes, 20 minutes later, it's like, oh, right, okay, here we go. And then he played Rich in Paradise by FBI Project. So that was the age of the piano. It's a big piano house tracks in the UK. And that was, and I just stood there and all those sensations of, you know, my blood turned to liquid gold and just smiling and just, you know, I could wax lyrical like an old raver for hours about it. But, um, for me, there's lots of subgenres with music and haircuts and style and fashion that don't ever work. I mean, you know, 
in the UK, there was skinheads, there was flat tops, there was goths, there was this and psychobillies. And they never re- they were sort of minimal, never really took off because they never really had a combination of music and drugs and attitude that all came together at the same time. But with that, with that combination of electronic synthesized music and elect- and synthesized drug, MDMA came together and it, wow. Without sounding naff, it was just the greatest drug and music combo ever invented, really, because it was just fantastic. So there we are. I can say that as a 54-year-old grizzled father of two. I'm not condoning drug use, but yeah, wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think a lot of people who have experienced that will definitely... Well, I mean, imagine, that's yeah. an agreed-upon fact. <laughs> um, and, you know, maybe you just needed the warehouse party to set the E off and not I like a vegan so, restaurant yeah. somewhere. Who knows? But uh, it was the first of many anyway, but there you go. You were going to talk about the the orbital raves, and I guess I was wondering what um, what connection you guys had to kind of the London scene and the parties that were going on, like in and around London. So the concept, I've said raving again, it's a bit of a loaded word, isn't it? But, um, but those parties, the orbital rave, orbital parties, 88 really, as ever, they started getting national province in the UK press, ecstasy airport, 11,000 youngsters go acid crazy in warehouse. <laughs> and the whole country just went, ooh, <laughs> I'll have a bit of that. But it didn't exist. <laughs> it was a bit like punk only really happened in London and Manchester. And But the, I think those parties, they didn't happen in the northwest of England. There was a big scene around Blackburn, but sticking to the orbital, orbital parties. So three or four organisations, Biology, Energy, Sunrise, very... Um, capitalistic, very money orientated. They just go along, they'd hire a fielder for farm, get fifteen thousand people in there, big sound system, and almost within weeks or months, the police just freaked out, the authorities freaked out, tried to stop them. Massive convoys of people, loads of press, orbital ads because they're inside the M25, which orbits London. And for us, we bought tickets for particle biology and uh, the tickets were like even then they were, I think they were forty quid each. So that's getting on for 100 quid now probably and we never got there we went to two of those parties we paid a lot of money we sat in a van we sat in the motorway the vote motorway was completely full all the slip roads the junctions were full nothing happening loads of police cars sat there all night went home happened again and we just thought fuck this we're just going to do it ourselves i guess for want of a better word because those parties were really just about money so yes it was a great vibe and those people had fun but they were very london very loaded, very middle class, very capitalistic, very leisure pursuit. And I mean, Matthew Collin in his book, Altered State, there's a brilliant bit in there about Tony Colston Hater, who is one of the main guys behind Energy and Sunrise. He said, well, we're just, this is a leisure option. We, we, it's not the 60s. We don't want to live this lifestyle. And he said there were people who did want to live it. We wanted to live it. And so we went back and said, we can. We didn't, again, looking back, hindsight is a wonderful thing. And, we, you know, I think subconsciously we thought we can take that and we can apply that to the free festival. We knew a lot of travellers who were key to the whole story, who were, you know, basically fairly lawless people who'd lived on the road since the 70s with the hippie ideal. They just did whatever they did. There was a series of festivals in the summer, like a circuit, and we just, I think, subconsciously thought, well, or even consciously thought, we can take that ethic of this party, but there's no money. If we make it free... The police won't be able to stop it and there'll be no finish times. It could go on for days. And then, you know, again, jumping around a bit, we went to Glastonbury in 1990. Even then, there was 100 and 150,000 people there. It was whatever it was, a ticket. And there was a huge free field and had been since 1970. So lots of the travellers would, you know, there's 20,000 people in the free bit. And Michael Levis, the organiser, tolerated it. You know, it's like these are anarchists and squatters and punks and all that, and they're not going to pay to get in. But so you can do what you wanted. So we, in 1990, we met some travellers. And there was Tonka Sound System, who were probably the other earliest house sound system in the UK. They were before us, but they sort of, they became, a lot of their members moved to San Francisco and formed Wicked, which is a whole different branch I'm sure we'll go on to later. But they were in one tent on the main drag in the free bit, and we were sort of 100 yards away with all these travellers' sound system, and they had the generator and the pyramid, this pyramid stage that they inherited off Hawkwind, and we had the records and the decks, and we all had <coughs> drugs. And we went for three or four days in the free field, and it was just, wow, this is 
we had to keep stopping so that bands could play, like so anarcho bands, and we go, oh, fucking hell, we're waiting eight hours to play. Then we could go on again, and then there was this sort of dig at negotiating, and you look back and laugh, and then one of the travellers, his name, Chili, he uh, he rang us a few weeks later and said, oh, we've been invited to this national, well, we found this National Trust car park called Pepperbox Hill, which is near Salisbury in Wiltshire. Do you want to come down? Because they didn't know anything about house music. They had no, we had the decks, we had the records, and they had the attitude. We all had the attitude, but they had the generators and the marquees, and the they, they just had the balls to just pile on somewhere and just do a free party. And we just thought, right, and we partied with them for like three years. So through thick and thin, through massive festivals, through Castle Morton, through small festivals, just us and this small bunch of travels, and the whole thing exploded over the summer of 91. So for the next two years, it just became huge in the UK. So prior to that, what was the music of like the hippie travelers? And I assume that not all of them wanted eight hours of Acid House going Three on days in their drug party. <laughs> <laughs> well, their music, it was fascinating because, again, this bunch of travelers that we started putting on parties with, they switched their boots to trainers and a lot of, you know, dreads were there, but their clothes became much more colorful. And their drug of choice, there was a lot of acid, you know, it moved into ecstasy. And the, the travellers scene had, whatever you way look at it, had become really shit. So the, the mid-80s, 85, 86, 87, there was a lot of heroin on site. I went to a lot of free festivals around there. And there were pretty sad affairs. There was the brew crew, which people was a brew, beer called Special Brew, which is like sort of uh, malt liquor in the US. It's 9%. You know, one can, you're over the driving limit, and they were just drinking that for days. So the music they were listening to was anarcho-punk. There's lots of, you know, like Crass and Flux and Big Indians and Hawkwind and uh, that sort of stuff, you know. Uh, Culture Shock were a big festival band from the Subhumans. And, yeah, that sort of music. And nothing electronic at all, other than maybe sort of noodly, crate, weird sort of Planet Gong Pink floyd sort of stuff. So I think it came as a shock to them. At the start, maybe 5% of travellers just thought, yeah, this is fantastic. 10% hated it, and the rest were sort of mm, nonplussed. And it, th those percentages moved over 91, 92, 93. By 94, they were all at it. They were all, oh, I love house music. I've always loved house music. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Well, you were calling us cheesy quavers three years ago and threatening to kill us, but never mind. But the logistics were difficult, you know, and a free festival, there's no toilets, there's no, it's just absolute chaos. So, but uh, yeah, I, I look back and shudder really <laughs> at some of the parties that we did, the sort of health and safety in the, um, well, there wasn't any. All right. Well, since you've landed there, can you tell me about some of these, some of these parties that were like complete chaos that you guys were involved with? Yeah. So, these were the very we have there's been a lot of conversation about where did the, the possibly the first free party free party distinguishing it in that we would turn up choose a site turn up stick, stick some buses on it set a sound system up set some lights set the decks up generator people start go bam 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 gone 10 o'clock in the morning we're gone or well that was the plan maybe by monday we're gone but so that's opposed to a festival which took had been going for donkages. That was new. That was brand new, this idea of the free party. So those started, no, those early free parties were just beautiful. There's like 200 people. So the first pepper box plays, there was probably 200 people at the first one and 500 the second one and 3,000 at the third. It just got, it just bumped because it was just a fantastic thing. And then the police obviously turned up and they were just did not know what to do. So they'd roadblock it. So those early parties got bigger and bigger. And then throughout the winter of 90, um, we did some big parties. We did one on an airfield at um, Barton Stacey's little places. We did them in warehouses. We did them in churches. We did them in fields and airfields and wherever, really. We got arrested a few times. There's a one Sopley army base. We broke, <laughs> you look back and laugh. We broke into an army, disused army base. Didn't go down very well. Um, and then the summer of 91, Spiral Drive, who was sort of also fundamental to this story. So the other sound system started appearing summer of 91, Spiral Tribe at the Solstice Festival in 1991. And suddenly it went bigger and bigger and bigger. So there was a huge party. It was a place called Chip in Sobbury, which was an Avon free festival, which went back to the 70s. Completely hijacked by sound system. 
us and the people called Sweat, and that was 20,000 people. And, of course, then by 1992, there was Castle Morton, which was, the uh, you know, our generation's Woodstock. It's a bit of a, it could be a lazy quote, but, uh, you know, that was the thing that suddenly it was all over the front pages. I think you saw that party we did at Scoreg, which is off the northern tip of Scotland. It was almost Denmark, you know what I mean? So we took the sound system up there, we drove for 17 hours in the truck, put it on a boat, drove to this hippie commune, 12 hours, unloaded it to the party, <laughs> three days. He couldn't leave, there was no roads to get, got to send off a boat to get alcohol, came back two days later. Uh, and we just departed <laughs> forever, abandoned gyms, airfields, you know, but at the same time, we were doing clubs all the way through. Did you have somebody in your crew that was like the master location scout? <laughs> Obviously, sometimes somebody would like ring up and be like, oh, I got this space. But like, you did have to go searching for them well, also. That's where the travelers came in, you see. So it was, a, it was a, as in Matthew Collins' book, again, it's probably the definitive text on Acid House, but all specifically... Three parties, he said, the tr- you know, the townies, the townie DJs, us and the travellers, you know, we danced a honeymoon ritual across the southwest of England. So they would just, it was, I mean, I'd look back and think, I don't know how you managed it with like mobile phones. We could leave a message on the answer machine and it'd be like, go to find the third tree, turn left at the rock and just open, you know, listen for thousands of people. I suppose you, you do what you, you know, you know, the, uh, you know, needs must, mustn't they? But we wouldn't find the travellers would find the venue. We had lots of venues in South Sheffield, Nottingham, Manchester, Leeds, London, Birmingham, Bristol, and people from there would just say, "We've got this railway tunnel. It's empty. Do you fancy it?" We'd go, "Yes." But with the ones in the country, it was the travellers. So they they needed somewhere to live. So they would drive round. They'd get evicted eventually from a site. They'd drive around in their crazy sort of wacky racers vehicles, find a site, pile on, and they'd think. If no one came within two days, they're like, right, okay, we'll have a party. So they'd ring us on our landline in Nottingham. We'd go, okay. We'd put it on the answer machine and we'd get a 1,000 people there. And post-Castle Morton, there was a lot of heat. We got arrested quite a lot. We got injunction served on our front door. We found a place. So we left the southwest. It all got too hectic. There's a place called Derbyshire, which is a county just above Nottingham. It's massive. There's no one there. They'd never heed the police and didn't know what was coming. And we just sort of hit them with lo- loads of p- parties and quarries and airfields and abandoned warehouses. And that was fantastic because the police, unlike down in the sort of Traveller Central, which was Wiltshire, Hampshire, down the southwest of England, you know, where where the travellers are traditionally from, and the, the police and the authorities in Derbyshire had no clue. So we got away with it for about a year before they, they sort of cottoned on what was going on. So... Myself and one of the travellers, Chili Phil, we used to, you know, we just drive around in my old beat up car and we'd find a quarry and go, Well, look at this. Here's a quarry with a massive entrance. It's just wow, beautiful, perfect. We did three parties there, got injuncted. I came home one day and I lived with Rick and Pete for years, walked in the flat and there's a, guy, there's a guy in a duffel coat playing my key. So we had a studio at home playing the keyboard and I was like, Who's this guy? And he goes, Oh, he's a detective inspector something from the police. So I was like, so why is he playing my keyboard? And he goes, oh, he's just serving an injunction on us. I was like, it's in time to get the fuck off my keyboard. <laughs> so it was like cat and mouse. <laughs> and I, I look back and I we had this big seven and a half ton yellow truck with a tail lift. Big set. I look back and think, wow, it's, you know. But we were young and mental and crazy. So there we are. And that's the other thing. I, I look back, Castle Morton was only 24 at Castle Morton. You are using 
the generators and all that stuff that the hippie travelers had. But at some point, DIY sound system, you guys had your own system called the Black Box. How long into doing DIY did it take for you to make your own sound? Well, not long. So we did our first ever park, Club Nights DIY, in November 1989, which is what we date our anniversaries from. Just had our 30th last year. Well, two years ago, in fact, no. We really got going in the summer of 1990. We very quickly realized that we needed a sound system because we were having to borrow them and beg them and we had to use the travelers and it was a bit shit. And we didn't build it. We just cheated. We just bought it. So we borrowed 10 grand of our mate's dad. There are these people in Nottinghamshire. It's always the right person, the right time, isn't there? When, you're, when you've got your wind in your sails, then the gods smile on you. These people are called entertainment sound systems and... They were all sort of sound geeks. They'd built these beautiful sound systems. We said, oh, have you got any, can you build us one? We got 10 grand. And they said, yeah. We said, make it compact because we're going to do lots of illegal parties. It needs to go into cellars. It needs to go into barns. It needs to go to the back of a truck. We need to pack it up really quick when the police arrived. And it was fucking enormous. It was the biggest W-bin 4K sound system, but the sound was beautiful. These power amps, graphic equalizer, at that point, we had personnel. We had about 15 people who were all making a living just about from DIY. So we had two or three guys, a guy called Julian, who ran the sound system. We had a couple of helpers, and we bought a truck. So we bought the sound system in the winter of, well, very early 1991, I think, as I remember. We ended up selling it to some friends in about 98, to some friends in Stroud, who have just restored it. They're real audio enthusiasts, bracket geeks. God bless them. And uh, they just restored it, and it's still sitting there. And every, so they brought it to our 30th. The sound is beautiful. So we were, apart from Tonka Post, we're the first, but probably are the best house sound system and the first house sound system. But that's how we did it. We just cheated. <laughs> and we did the same thing with our studio. So instead of buying, like, I'm sure DJ Pierre or Frankie Knuckles, they bought a 303 and an 80. We didn't do any of that. Our mate who's a drug dealer, we went to this studio. We bought their entire studio in a vat. And he said, how much do you want? It's a 20 grand. And he just put the money down in cash. And said, there you go. And he said, I'm not going to ask where the money's from. I said, no, I wouldn't if I was you. And did you have to pay that guy back? Or was he just like... We paid it. Well, it was, our, it was Simon's dad. And we did pay back monthly, 250 quid a month for whatever that is. And then when we all sort of fell apart and we stopped, I don't know what happened, to be honest. I think he... Yeah, I don't know. Probably still have him. So you paid. You guys paid everybody equally, right? That was like part of the whole yeah, deal. Yeah, we did. Not only that, but anyone had a kid, we gave him a bonus. So we called it a nip. A nip is a slang word for kid in England. So we gave him a child bonus. So everyone, all we did, I mean, all the way to the free parties, we were also doing club nights all over the all over the world. But we'd do like a monthly night in Liverpool, a monthly night in Hull, a monthly night in Manchester, in Birmingham, in Nottingham, in Leeds. So they'd give us, again, we, we managed to not drop it quite a lot of times, and they'd give us the 50, two grand. And we, everyone, half of it went to DIY, which paid for our office. We had an office and recording studio, and we had to pay for the PA, and we had to pay for trip, all that, and phone bill. And then the other half got split evenly. So the lighting guy got 75 quid, or the DJs got 75 quid. So our DJs were obviously Simon and Diggs and Woosh. And Jack were very well known. So, but they got the same, and if they complained, it was tough shit because we were a collective. So, um, we, we gave a lot of money to, we had guest DJs on, and we stopped after DJ Pierre. We paid him, I think, two grand, and he just obviously I met Pierre. Future. He's an interesting guy. His music is very, very druggy, but he's never done drugs. I drove him up from London, the guy who rented Acid House, and he's like, oh, okay. And he just didn't know what to play, so he just didn't. And we just said, we're not going to put any big names on. We just stopped putting big names on. We thought, fuck it, what's the point of paying people two grand? So that was about 1994. But yeah, we all got paid equally, including me. So there was a lot of squabbling who, who, who got... If they'd ring up and say, I want some DIY DJs in Liverpool next month. There was quite a fair bit of squabbling, but that was my job to sort it out. Even then, there was a lot of people who said they got it, and then they didn't. And then they'd come and DJ for us, and then they'd start whinging about money. And we'd just say, oh, you're not going to... Well, this is the way it is. And they'd say, well, my name should have been bigger on the fly. And you say, yeah, but it wasn't, was it? Because we don't do that. We don't We don't care who you are. We had Derek Carter. Derek Carter, he was fantastic. He was, we had, a lot of, we had, we had um, Larry Hershover, and his manager said... He complained about 
Larry's hotel room and just said, "Well, tell Larry tough shit. We just we just paid for we just paid for his flight. We're just paying him X amount of money." And he, you're going to this isn't Spinal Tap. We had Lenny Fontana, I think it was, on a, an all nighter, and his manager came down and said, "Lenny wants to go home because he's tired. He, he wants to he wants the early start." So we'll go tell Lenny to fuck off. He can go home. He's not going to get any money. And he's listening. Married. He's like, "What?" I said, well, you have never been to Manchester, have you? He's like, we know that's not what we do. We don't I'm not gonna move the slots. He's he's we just paid a flight for him for X amount of money. We've given him the best slot, two till four. And if he's a bit <laughs> tired, tell him to take some drugs. We were flying over to the US from ninety two onwards. We used to go to Dallas every year to play for the Hazy Days crew. We used to go to New York, San Francisco, LA. And I think it's probably the same in the nineties in underground scene and all those urban centers. But the UK in the 90s was just debauched, deranged, disgraceful. It was like the 60s, but probably better. And we probably had better music. And then we also had Britpop over here at the same time, which is also a very druggy sort of subculture. And it was just a fine time to be alive, to be honest. Again, I look back at the risk assessments and there weren't any. We look back and we just, we took on the state, really. And all we were doing was parties, but you know everything we did was made illegal. They brought the Criminal Justice Act in in 1994, which made ravings actually mental. Yeah, I'm, I will go on. I got to back up <laughs> because... Yeah, <I'll> rewind. <laughs> all right, yeah. so can we, let's back it up a second to Castle Morton Common. You, you mentioned the Avon Free Festival, which is basically yeah. what Castle Morton ended up out of. Explain to somebody who has no idea... What that was, what happened, why was it important? With the travellers and the festival circuit, they they have they trace their mythical roots back to ancient world England, you know, to Albion, to Stonehenge. We don't know what Stonehenge was used for, but it was probably used for some sort of ceremony. And it's probably fairly likely they probably took some psilocybin mushrooms and possibly drank some mead and got intoxicated and howled at the moon and worshipped their gods and had some sort of drumming. Who knows? Fairly likely. So the, the whole traveller movement was it was an attempt to sort of recreate, not recreate, but sort of work, you know, look back and celebrate and recreate this ancient mythical England, going back to megalithic times and the Druids, etc. And so that was the idea. So it started obviously in the 60s because everything did. And they tried to recreate in the 70s. So there was over the summer, because the summer's warmer. As I'm sure you know, Britain's weather is shit in the winter for shit anyway, bad in the winter. So over the summer, there'd be a series, the big ones, the solstice. And then there was Avon Free Festival, which is the end of May, which has always been a bank holiday here, so everything's closed, so you get Monday off work. So every year, Avon Free Festival would move. I went to it in 1985, and it was a really shitty reclaimed bit of land near Bristol somewhere, maybe 2,000 people. Not good. Lots of unpleasant drugs, lots of shit music, whatever. You know, it rained. In you know, 91, it was at a place called Chipping Sobbury. Um, May Bank holiday, maybe 20,000 people, maybe 10,000 people. And suddenly there was townies there. Before that, these free festivals had just been crusties, as we call them, travellers, you know, hippies. And then things suddenly changed over 1991. Suddenly all these ravers turning up with sound systems in their cars and trainers are all clean and wearing baseball caps and all that jazz. Over the winter of 91, everyone, you know, in the winter, there was a few little parties, but there was something in the air, and I remember it. To this day, and was thinking the next big festival in the circuit is just going to go berserk, which happened to be Avon Free Festival at the end of May. And basically, there's no publicity, no flies, no mobile phones, no nothing, nothing in the press. And the police shunted all these travellers over the sort of county line, and they said they found this place in the map, Castle Morton Common, which no one ever heard of. And we got a phone call on the Wednesday night. We're going to a place called Castle Morton Common. So we drove down on the Thursday, and... The big mistake the authorities made was on the national news on all the channels at 6 p.m. on Friday. There was an enormous illegal free rave going on in Gloucestershire. And the whole nation's youth went, right, I know where I'm going. And they, me and Pete sat there on the Friday night looking down on this hill in the dark. And all we could see for miles each way was just headlights, 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 you know, just thousands and thousands of cars. And they reckon that no one knows, but I reckon there's easily 50,000 people on there on the Saturday night. And you have to remember, this is a totally illegal, unlicensed uh, gathering. It's not Coachella. It's not Burning Man. It's not uh, it's Glastonbury. Those are all pay events that are organized and licensed. This was just totally illegal. You would not get away with this in America at all. You'd get shot. 
Uh, and I don't think you'd get away with it in England, Britain or England anymore, to be honest. So it was absolutely <laughs> lost. But the great thing was the weather. From Thursday night when we got there till we left on Tuesday morning, it was just beautiful and broken English sunshine. So there was like a the atmosphere was fantastic, but we were surrounded by police and surrounded by the world's media. So down below where we were, we had a big marquee. Down below where we were, there was like Italian TV, American TV, French TV, all these transmission vans. And there was police helicopters. Someone tried to shoot police helicopter down using, you know, flares, not the trousers, but the, um, you know, the boats, the flare thing. Uh, there was eight sound systems. There was Spiral Tribe. They were all Spiral Tribe, Bedlam, Adrenaline, all these sort of notorious, because they obviously played very different music to us, which is another whole PhD subject. So they all played serious techno, breakbeat techno, nosebleed, as we called it, sort of 160 beats per minute. And we were playing house and jazz and, and hip-hop and on the edge. And it was just wonderful, but the national press didn't think it was so wonderful. And so we got from being, the year before, we were on page three of the local press to being on the front page of all the national newspapers. And it was just these people, you know, this the, the, the government just had to act. So it just blew the cover, really. So suddenly it became a national debating point. It was on, it just became the topic of the day. And Spiral Tribe stayed there for about a week, wouldn't turn their system off, all got arrested, got their sound system impounded. I've been back there twice over the years since, and it is the quietest place I've ever been to my life. It's this huge common the size of, like, Golden Gate Park. You know what I mean? It's huge. <laughs> and there was just no one there. There was just this old lady cycling across it. I thought, fuck me, they must have been pissed off. We were there for, like, a week. But it was, you know, there was no toilets. There was no... It was lovely. <laughs> it was like a village fate atmosphere, you know. It was very... It, I think the outside world, it was this terrible sort of horrendous, monstrous, illegal thing. But in there, it was just wonderful. It was lovely. Everyone was just off their face. There was a big, clear diving pool, which had already been a quarry, and people just jumping off 30, 40 feet into this pool, swimming around. Great. So, yeah, but it led directly to the Criminal Justice Act, which was a law which made raving. And as I say, it used the word rave. It made raving a criminal offence. So... It was the apex, it was the pinnacle of it. it. Just it grew with the scene, grew and grew and grew. And after that, it just the police were just determined they couldn't have had to answer to their political masters. So after that, anything big, they just squashed it and we retreated back up to Nottinghamshire and Derbyshire, and that was the end of the big free festivals, really. So they couldn't shut it down because it was just too big for them to possibly like end it. It's a mystery because they didn't roadblock it because they said they couldn't because there were so many cars and it was just they would have backed up the motorway and the entire southwest of England would have come to a standstill. There was a conspiracy that they'd let it happen so it would get so big so they could then introduce draconian laws. But hey, we know where that ends up with QAnon, doesn't it? And that sort of conspiracy theory. The British police are nothing like the American police. I've been I've been at parties in America when the police turn up and they can't argue with them or reason with them. They've got guns and it happens over here. You know, there was this sort of ongoing dialogue and they said, OK, well, we'll just get everyone on here and then we can contain it. And that, that was a lot of people. But it was, yeah, I, it was huge, huge. It went on for days. There was a lot of poo. <laughs> but uh, it was just lovely. You'd look and there was a traveller and a donkey, some rich cokehead from London in his Porsche. And then there was an estate dodgy guy from some council, you know, from some projects somewhere. And then there was a couple of students and then there, and there was just everyone. <laughs> and I genuinely think they looked at that and thought that is a pretty dangerous mix of people to be completely lawless and high on drugs in the middle of the countryside. So they stopped. They didn't entirely stop it, but that's when Glastonbury completely changed. So after that, Glastonbury had fences and it had the police on site and they arrested people. And before that, it was just a lawless, everything changed. And now Glaston is on Radio 1. It's transmitted live on the national public radio. It was a definite turning point. It was the old, it was the old sort of English sort of setup, lawless. And, that you know, it was the turning point of the new sort of militarised state, really. So how long was it from Castle Morton until the criminal justice bill dropped? Like, did it feel instantly or did it feel like, oh, this is like we're waiting for what's going to happen next? Well, interestingly, because obviously it's all this is a political backdrop. So Margaret Thatcher had res resigned in 1990 and John Major, the Conservatives, there's an election in 1992. So 
they wanted to mop up lots of votes in the country. So they basically said, well, they included the bit about raving. They said, we're going to stop free parties and we're going to stop free festival. So the white paper was published in 1992, very quickly after Castle Morton, but it didn't become law until 1994. So it was a two-year gap, but that's sort of, unless it's Brett, you know, that's how lo- that's how slow legislation is, because people forget it was Section 63 was a bit about raving, but there was a whole other hundred sections. There was lots of things. It, it abolished the right to silence if you've been arrested in the UK. It introduced privatisation of prisons. It banned hunt saboteuring, lots and lots of other stuff as well. It wasn't just to deal with acid house parties. It was lots and lots of serious infringements of civil liberties. So it made trespass a criminal offence. So it took them two years to get it through Parliament. So, But it, yeah, the, culturally, Castlemore was definitely a turning point. There was a big festival collapsed and it was about two months later and it was just a nightmare. So the police, there were so many police, you couldn't get in or out. It got really paranoid. There was a lot of really bad drugs. There was a lot of fighting and mugging and bloody blah, blah. You know, it was a bit like Ultimont, I guess, if you want a sixes comparison. It was very dark. We just quit. At that point, we stopped going to free festivals. It had become a battle zone with the police. Spiral Tribe went on to do some huge parties. They got arrested every time. But we'd learned that you can't take on the state because you're always going to lose. Just decided to go back to basics and went back up to like Nottinghamshire, Derbyshire, and put on parties for like. St- they started with 100, 200 people and again, a thousand people. And that was fine. It was lovely. It was just nice to not have it stopped, really. So. You talked a little bit about the music and how the music of what DIY was playing was different than the kind of hard techno and like nosebleed. And I imagine really different too than the sort of what must have seemed like corporate rave acts at the time, because the other thing that's happening at like 91, 92 is you're getting like the prodigy in the charts and alternate and all of these rave acts that have a sort of stylized image and are selling the idea of rave. Yeah, that's true. So every year, this is your breakthrough act, as you say, there was alternate, you know, there was uh, Chemical Brothers, there was Underworld, there was... Yeah, it, was, it wasn't so much them. It was the super clubs, I think, that was galling to watch. But it was, we were purists. We were house purists. My theory is that whenever you first listen to house music, and if that's combined with, with some drug experience, and that will always be what you think of as raving or dancing. So for some people, that's hardcore. But for us, it was original Chicago house, you know, 87, 88. And techno for me was, you know, Jefferson, May, and Saunders, you know, Saunders. It was that really nice. Uh, rhythm is rhythm, Mr. Fingers, Larry Heard type of techno. You know, that we were house viewers and we went on to that became deep house. We played deep house, nothing above 128 beats per minute, really. In fact, we threw quite a lot of people off the decks. We'd have kids coming up at free part festivals so saying, with their 20, 12 inches, and go, Can I play? And we'd look at the records and go, No, you can fuck off. <laughs> what do you mean? You're supposed to be like free party anarchists. And yeah, we're not that anarchist, though. He's like, I'm sorry, we, <laughs> we borrowed 10 grand to buy this sound system. You're not going on. It's like we're, <laughs> we're, we're, we're anarchists as everybody comes to music when we're fascists. So I'm really sorry about that. But it was more the sort of super clubs, which was Cream and Gate Crasher <laughs> and, and a lot of people, Pete Tong, Perfecto, Paul Oakenfold, all that sort of scene. We knew most of those bands. We, were on, we knew Underworld. I mean, you have to remember with DIY, we hated being pigeonholed. So we were also going to Ibiza all the time. We were going to flow to San Francisco. We were going to, we to Ibiza every year. We had a villa. Hanging out with Jose Padilla at the Cafe Del Mar. We got to play at Space, which is, you know, one of my favourite clubs ever. Uh, so we did do the whole, uh, you know, large in it that's over here, but the whole slightly rock and roll. Uh, you know, we, we weren't averse to making money. We just weren't very good at it. So it was more the sort of super clubs. They'd come out with all the merch and the merchandise, and it's like this isn't what Acid House is about. So we just we never managed to make any T-shirts. We never did any merchandise. We never we didn't do anything to deliberately make money. If you know what I mean? We spent it all on putting put it back into free parties. So.
our two probably load stars were Crass and the KLS. And we, we wanted to change, one of your questions, you know, we wanted to change the world. We didn't want to make money. We didn't want to object to making money. We made quite a lot of money. We spent a lot of money on a recording studio in Nottingham and spent a lot of money on other things. We wanted to change the dynamic of the music business. We didn't want to do promos. We didn't want to do marketing plans. We did, we, when we did, we did an album for Warp in 1993. I mean, Warp's probably the most respected electronic music label ever. <laughs> certainly one of them from Sheffield. And uh, they said, oh, we've got 12 interviews lined up. We said, we're not doing any interviews. And Steve Beckett from Warp, who's very northern and sort of uh, blunt, he said, what do you mean you're not doing any fucking interviews? And we don't want to, we don't want to sell the album. We don't. He goes, well, it's fucking my album. You know? <laughs> and it was number three in the independent album charts behind Bjork and The Shaman. And we were distributed for Sony for a while. So that was, that sort of thing was kind of awkward. <laughs> it's like we were distributed by one of the world's biggest record labels. When we run our own label, it's a nightmare because you're involved in the music business and you have to kind of, we released uh, 90 odd records and DIY discs and strictly for grievers. And so it's difficult. We had people making music for us. It's like, oh, do you want to do an interview? And they're like, no. And you think, oh, shit, that's what we said. But if you don't do an interview, you're not going to sell any, sell any records, are you? So um, we, we trotted a, a, new, a line. I think no one ever quite knew where we were coming from. So a lot of the city people thought we were crusties. And because we always refused to do photos of individuals, and a lot of the crusties thought we were city people and football hooligans. And we kind of liked that to keep them guessing. Yeah, I mean, the music business has always been the music business, hasn't it? But I don't think Ray was ever going to change it. I mean, I think, you know, the internet's changed music business entirely, but the music business will always cotton on. It will always regurgitate. It will always take a pure idea like it did with punk and like it did with rock and roll, like it did with that, and it will sell it back to the kids, won't it? Speaking of earning lots of money and then losing it, can you tell me the story about playing at Universe and dropping like thousands of pounds on the floor? <laughs> yeah so i guess we never had i was sort of the manager so i never dj so all the other core members of, of diy dj so i decided early on I, I couldn't be asked to be honest so uh i was often the person who had to be together at four or six a.m and so universe was very interesting because it was like a crossover between a big pay rave and a free fest a free party so still in touch with those guys they managed to straddle it quite obviously it was 20, 30 quid a ticket, 20 quid a ticket, and it had it finished at 6 a.m. or 8 a.m. And it was all, there was security, but it was almost like a lawless free party vibe before it all went sort of strict and money grabbing and all that. So you just do your own tent. You have your own tent. So we'll give you five and a half grand and you just pay everyone, pay the tent, pay the, the laser guy, the light. Yeah, okay. Done that a thousand times. So again, there was no bank transfers in those days. So, <laughs> so they pay us in cash. At 8 a.m., me and Piers, are you ready? He's like, no. We went into this uh, porter cabin, whatever you'd call them, you know, this like static caravan that was there with our eyes like, yeah, hello. <laughs> you have to remember, we're only 25 at this point. And the guy, he's literally, he's got a briefcase chained to his wrist. He's like an accountant, proper straight guy. It loosened his shirt because it was a wreck, but he was sitting there going, oh, oh okay, are you from DIY? Do you have any ID? I'm like, fuck off. <laughs> what? Uh, no. He goes, well, I've got five and a half. He says, right. And he says, <laughs> here, it's all counted out into hundreds, and I'm going to go back to where we meet. So Pete picked up the money and he just dropped it all over the floor. And that they had people check this accounting guy. There was someone else checking that he was legit and he wasn't. <laughs> So there's two of them, totally straight. They'd obviously been asleep all night and they paid them to go to bed, get up and handle the money because we'll be off our tits. And when they just looked at us and we just burst out laughing, <laughs> hysterically laughing, because shit's on me. <laughs> Is it all there? And we just, me and Pete, we're, we're gone, hands and knees, <laughs> crawling around. It's like some surrealist film from the 60s. And we're just crawling around, our, just picking it up and put it in our pockets, just absolutely pissing out, just laughing our hands off and then dropping it again. And I was like, have you got a bag, mate? Have you got a bag? Like an ask, you know, like a supermarket <laughs> bag. And he's like, Jesus, who are you again? When are we DIY? <laughs> so, right. We got rebooked to go, you know. So, uh, and then we just came out and we said, paying everyone. We're trying to pay everyone. But did it, you know, so people say to me, what skills did you come out of the rave game with? I go, counting money in back rooms at five or six o'clock in the morning. 
<laughs> I mean, I don't, I don't think most, uh, I don't think most DJ crews are really. I mean, that's that's really funny to me because, like, I feel like every time I've been on really good ecstasy, like I can't handle money at all. Paper, like it's like it? money is just like a joke to me, and I'm, I'll be trying to buy a water or something and I like can't figure out how money works. If that's the thing about those big bands, they all have managers so they deal with all that. It's going back to Led Zeppelin, isn't it? You can get as wanker as you like, you can get as waste as you like, just do the business and I, the, Mr. X will take care of all the money, they'll pay this much, it doesn't matter what you do, they'll chuck you on the, we'll shove you in the limo, we'll shove you in the plane but we weren't like that, we were a collective, we, we, you know, we got offered quite a lot of money to do it now, we got offered uh, 10 grand, you know, got offered money from quite a lot of people to we turned it down again, but I was in Andrew Weatherall's office once in London, in Soho, in probably '92, something like that, uh, '91, '92, and he just remixed the Loaded album for a uh, Scream of album for Primal Scream, a seminal moment in the whole crossover. And he was, he's out on the phone, right? He's like, "Yeah, all right, all right, yeah, it's, it's Andrew. Yeah, he's like, um, how much? Nah, I'm not doing that. No, nah, I'm not doing. Sorry, mate." And he, Puts the phone. He goes, who was I? He goes, oh, I just told me 50 grand to remix this uh, indie dance crossover CD. I'm like, oh, I will do it. <laughs> but, but it was like, oh, he just said, no, that was the great thing about Weatherall. When he died, <laughs> whatever it was last year, it was the end of an era. It, it, it was the end of Acid House in the UK, really, as a thing, because he was so, like, authentic and he's so principled. Whereas a lot of Oakenfolds and the big DJs and the Sashas and the... I don't even know who DJs are anymore. We, you know, we end up with David Goetta, don't we? And Paris Hilton and, you know, getting paid, whatever. But we stuck to our guns and I'm quite proud. We, we had a, I've still got the guest list from 92. and We did a club that was 350 capacity and we had 270 people on the guest list. <laughs> and uh, the guy who ran the club is a bit of a gangster and he's like, how are you going to make any money? He goes, well, we're probably not. He goes, do you want me to go and tax all the dealers? You go, no, you're okay. You're okay. Proud of that, really. There's enough distance between what happened and now for it to become historically very interesting and relevant. We're on the party and protests in the 90s syllabus. DIY are in there. And I get an email from some random kid uh, saying, can you give me a quote? I'm doing party and protest is my module for my sociology degree. Can you give me a, a quote about what it was like? Okay. Yeah, okay. So I guess that's just hilarious. We are now part of the sociology syllabus and the politics syllabus for 20-year-olds. It was the last gasp of utter lawlessness in the UK. We have a long history of lawlessness. And since the 90s, there's been nothing like it, really. For kids, you know, I mean, God, never mind with COVID, but even even in the noughties, the it's just, you can't do that shit anymore. So I'm proud. <laughs> well, it's interesting because I was I used to read NME and Melody Maker growing up because I was really into like Depeche Mode and The Cure and Susie and all that stuff. And I saw the picture of Castle Morton. And then not that long after that, I had a tape or a CD of Carl Cox at Universe. And these were like two of the magical items that made me like I was too young to go to a rave yet. I mean, I went to my first one when I was 13. But <laughs> I think I must have had those when I was like 11 or 12. And then I was like, Oh, my God, like, this is amazing. I want it. How do I do this? Also, the image for me of seeing all these people kind of standing up to the police and being like, no, we're going to have this 100,000 person free party because this is our land and like there's nothing you can do. It is. I'm getting goose pimples as you say it. Yeah. You know, again, you could do a good PhD on many bits of it, but the thing about land rights that you mentioned, of course, it wasn't our land. It was common land. And common land is a, it's been argued and fought over in, in, in England uh, for the last thousand years and probably longer. What we quickly realised was when we pile on somewhere, is, there's this idea, because England's so small you know, compared to the US, and it's also beautiful countryside, chocolate box countryside. And what people think is that the countryside's just there and it's all lovely and they don't think... But it's actually most of it is owned by huge landowners who live in London. They're owned by people whose ancestors go back a th six, seven, eight hundred years, own 20,000, 30,000 acres. And when we started partying on those, you, you realise... It's a very old version of England. It's got, you are challenging land rights that go back a 
hundred centuries. And the police, you soon realise whose side the police are on when it comes to the sort of land rights. They're on the side of the rich landowners. And it's fascinating. The travellers, all they ever wanted was a little bit of land and they could never find anywhere to live. But yeah, that level as Lawrence, it was, it was viscerally exciting at the time. I, I, I just, I remember thinking at the time, this is just mind blowing. There was a festival at a place called Morton Lighthouse, which is near Liverpool. So it was extra lawless. And it was the only festival, I think, that we ever were part of that took place within five miles of a city. It was in a place called Birkenhead, which is there. And it was on this common land and the, the locals disputed it. And they'd, they'd formed a row of police range rovers across the land. And we stopped in the vehicles and we just smashed them out of the way. I can't believe this day that we did it. We just smashed four or five. Those vehicles must have been cost, God knows. We just smashed them out of the way in these buses and drove onto this side. And just pulled up and just thought, what have we done? We just did it. We, you know, and Castle Morton, he'd been there. You just think, hmm. how does this end? What if it never ends? It's like, what are they going to do? And the police helicopters are flying overhead. You could watch yourself on the telly on a little TV and a traveller's bus, just thinking, oh, right, okay. But it's it's not Waco, and it's not like some crazy thing. It's just a party. At the end of the day, that's what we're doing is we're just having fun. But it became politicised because of, for all those reasons. So, yeah, it was Generation E, they called it, and everyone, it was just such a, it was just such a great laugh, and it had the added thrill of being illegal, it felt illegal, felt like we were changing the world, felt we were taking on the state taking on our parents we were and we were having an absolutely riotous debauch time it's like what's not to like you know it was a punk ethic but i was a anarcho punk for a bit and all that and it was just became so negative self-destructive and probably punk maybe it always was most punk gigs i went to were just mainly men moshing kicking the shit out of each other like you said drinking loads doing loads of speed and blah 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 Whereas raving, obviously, it was positive. There was lots of hugging, and it was female. I think a lot. One of the big things was that it was very safe for women. The dance floor. No one's going to grope you. No one's going to try it on. Paradoxically, with all that scaremongering, it was actually a very safe environment. People were interested in getting off with each other. They were just interested in dancing. That is what we did. Really, was bring that punk ethic that you say about the excitement, the challenging, the noise, the sort of anti-authority, and we just applied that to this wonderful new American synthetic music. Um, so when was the first time that you went to San Francisco? And then when did you end up moving there? And what were the events that kind of led you to just be like, I'm getting out of the UK? So the first time that Rick and Pete went to San Francisco first, the year I went to Beath, they all lived together. So I would just, we just we sort of drew straws. We had a friend called Steve Gray, who said to a record label called Love from San Francisco. And he knew all the wicked lot. 90% of whom are English, I think. So Marky and Yana and Emma and Garth and Harvey and all those sort of types who've been living there since, I think, eight, late 80s. So they started Wicked almost the same time we started DIY. There was a very parallel thing. And then we took Ricky Pete over there and they just gelled really well. So the three of us went back over in 93 and we stayed with Hard Kiss in this beautiful house up in uh, Twin Peaks, which is pretty amazing. And then the next year, we rented a house of a guy. We paid two and a half thousand dollars. We put an hour thing in mix bags. If anyone wants to come, we're, everyone could come. We didn't mean it. And then 48 people turned up. We had a three bedroom flat apartment on Divisadero Street. And it was literally 50 people, all crazed British people. A lot of them had never been abroad before. I don't think you'd get away with it now. And we just, it was just drug craze. It was opposite a sort of crazed crack den on Divisadero Street. The sleeping bags were like that. Nearly got arrested. We'd been on the roof next door about seven o'clock in the morning, tripping. Uh, and every time we went there, we always left a couple of people, never came back. So we had Darren Davis, who set up Tweaking Records, stayed there. And Charles Webster was sort of associated with, he moved there. Damien O'Grady, just a whole lot of people set up Love from San Francisco. So the, the Wicked crew played for us and we played for them. At first, I went to an amazing free party in Half Moon Bay in probably 92, 93. Used to go to their night at Community and something other like Folsom Street and all that and the end up. I mean, it's just a fantastic city, isn't it? So me personally, I got most cliche going through a few issues with drugs, a few addiction problems and late, you know, way after all this in the late 90s, I moved to... I moved to San Francisco in 2000 to get away from drugs, which 
on reflection was uh, not Which not is a my terrible brightest, idea. It was not my brightest idea ever I don't think so that went well but I moved I lived there from 2000 till 2007 so we still got quite a lot of people who live and work there so a lot of these people became couples and then they got babies who are now 20 and 25 and the same thing happened to be honest in Thailand and Goa and Sydney and Ibiza and Amsterdam and and Barcelona and Rio and New York it was a diaspora I suppose and Wicked were they were from Tonka, so it's got this almost kind of like mythical thing that we were both together. Glastonbury 1990 was this, much like the Gathering of the Tribes, shall we say, in Golden Gate Park in 67, was it? It was this kind of, you can trace it back to there. And there were two sound systems. There was Tonka, which became wicked and moved to San Francisco and DIY. And we had this, we've still got this very strong bonds 30 years later. I can't say I made my best of my time in San Francisco, but that's a different story. (laughs) <laughs> I survived. Yeah, I think so, part of the reason I moved away from there was like to get away from all the drugs. Yeah, that's where I went wrong, isn't it? <laughs> and I moved <laughs> I moved from San Francisco. I now live in this farmhouse in Wales, which is in rural Wales. I don't know if you know Wales, but obviously it's the most isolated rural part of the UK. And it's it's probably the most polar opposite. I lived in the Tenderloin in San Francisco before I moved here. This is probably the most polar opposite of anywhere on the planet in, a, in the developed world to San Francisco. So there we are. I guess every, every, you could say everywhere has like magical lands, but it always seems like when people talk about, especially this free party scene in England, it's like tapping into, as you mentioned, this sort of ancient thing with Stonehenge and everything where there's like all these ancient lands where people were like throwing magical festivals in like the 1500s or whatever. It feels like a lineage. Well, Stonehenge was built 4,000, 3,000 BC. So I'm, they were having festivals there 5,000 years ago. So yeah, it is. It is a, I guess America's, I guess America, the native in, Native American scene would be, you know, when they have uh, ayahuasca rituals and stuff like that, I guess. But it's managing to, tie those things together isn't it really without feeling like a cultural appropriation but it's not in our case because those people are long gone so i guess there was always that mythical air especially england as opposed to wales and scotland england has this this ancient mythical you know king arthur blah blah camelot glastonbury so there was an extra romantic part of that you know i guess if you're just in a field in somewhere or other i don't know not quite the same, but we went to a lot of ranch parties outside Dallas, and they rented they rented one of them, one of them off the Nation of Islam. I was like, "Fuck me!" <laughs> the most notoriously anti-drug, and these huge black guys, you know, Nation of Islam on this ranch. They were the security. I was thinking, "Wow, they was fine in the end." But I was like, "Wow, you don't get this in England. <laughs> it's like, this is different." You know, we live in this sort of uh, tradition-bound society that's completely different to America in that way, and. One of them is that you are allowed a certain amount of freedom. You don't have a constitution, but there's this inherent freedom of common land. The other is the police don't carry guns. And the police, most of the time, to be honest, would just reason with us. So when, when are you going to stop this? And we go, I don't know, Monday? <laughs> Monday. Well, we thought maybe 6 a.m. We go, all right, 10 a.m., 11 a.m., 7, 8.30. All right, we just say, no. But when we got to 8.30, we took, turn it down and turn it up again. But... They, we tried doing that with the police in San Francisco, and he just said, you know, sh- what did you say, motherfucker? I went, um, just wondering if we could carry on. He said, what time did your permit finish? I went, six. He goes, just shut the fuck up. I was like, okay. <laughs> Different world, really, but there you go. So, yeah. We just have this much lower deference to authority, I suppose. So I think when they wicked arrived in San Francisco, they said, why can't we just go and do a party in Golden Gate, why can't we just go somewhere and just do this? And then in Dallas, why, and it was like, well, you can't. Well, you can. What's, you know, yeah, the police have got guns, but really it's a mental, it's a state of mind, isn't it? But if you've got the right people, most important, and the right music and the right drugs and the right sound system, but most importantly, the right people and attitude, you can still transfer that idea anywhere. We've done parties in the most ridiculous shitholes, you know, like, well, and they've just been fantastic, you know, 50 people. It doesn't have to be. Castle Morton, 
in fact, quite the opposite because you sort of tend to start losing control at the edges and you get, it becomes, much like Woodstock again, it becomes at the edges, the lawlessness comes in and then you get Altamont and you, the, the scene, this, this starts breaking down really because it get, you start attracting the idiots, I suppose. But interestingly, I mean, what the British have been doing and the English specific, well, the British have been doing for 50 years is, is taking American music, which house music was and which punk really was and rock and roll was and psychedelic rock, all of it, and just giving it some attitude and selling it back to America. And every 10 years, you'd get a load of bored teenagers who were bored. The bored have been told what to do. They've been bored of the scene that's now 10 years old. They think, whatever, sick of their older brothers and you know, going on about it. So we want something new. So along comes punk rock. Young people, we'll have you know, we'll have this bar, and then they become the older siblings, and then the next generation of bores. So we get acid house, but it mystifies me. It just seems to have stopped. So I don't know if I'm just an old fart. We had sort of Brit pop over here, but I guess in the noughties, I think that the digitization of music has changed everything. All that music is instantly available. The idea of physically owning music has gone, and it's just so fragmented. But we were part of a wider sociological thing. You couldn't recreate punk, could you? So the thing with rave it's been done. And I think the next, it's, it's only when you get that sort of music with a new drug. What happened with house and hip hop was obviously drum machines and samplers and keyboards and sequences all became affordable. That's what drove the music. So 16 year olds in Chicago and London and Nottingham and San Francisco playing with those machines and making music. And when you combine that music with ecstasy, it just, wow, this is this is the one. I think the next stage will be when people actually plug themselves into something. You know, you put a thing on, you think the music. So it's like a theremin, but you're creating music through your thoughts without any need for a computer, but I'm sure it's not far away. And then also the drug world is fragmented. When I was a kid, there was only five drugs. You know, there was cannabis, there was speed, coke, acid, and smack. And that was it. Ecstasy came along. And now there's... I'm a drug worker if I trade. There's like hundreds and hundreds of substances. So it's all fragmented, isn't it? I guess the idea that anything could come along and just sweep everything before it on a generational way like Punk and Acid House did, I don't know, hopefully. I feel like all the drugs that have been really popular in the last couple years have all been super downers, which don't really lend themselves to like, a community feeling or like a party vibe people do a lot of ketamine and people do like a lot of like xanax and prescription drugs which don't i don't know i guess you get xanax rap is what you get out of that you can't dance on oxycontin can you no, not really. At the end of the day, ecstasy is methyl dioxide, methamphetamine. It's a methamphetamine, like crystal meth, but it's a lot nicer, obviously. But it's uh, it's an upper, so it makes you dance, it makes you stay up, it makes you talk, it makes you euphoric. It may be a crash, and it may, in the long run, we don't know, it may be bad for you physically. But in the short term, for those 12 hours, it's very positive, isn't it? GHB or ketamine or DMT or oxycontin or morphine, nitrous, all those drugs are not great for uh, a nice, for, for, but they're not spiritual drugs, are they, that make you go and hug your neck friend? They make you sit in a puddle in the corner, which, which can be fun, you know, we've all been there. But in terms of a bright new dawn of changing society, of spiritual awareness, no, nah, it's not really happening, is it, I guess? I would like to just mention the passing of Pete, who's my oldest friend I've known since I was 15, who died in October the 2nd last year. So it was a big loss. Hope he's doing okay. There we are. I think he's got a lot of cool people to party with, hopefully, where, <laughs> where he's at. <laughs> Let's hope so. Unless he went to the other place. Where, again, can people find out about spirit wrestlers and what are some of the things that um, that you guys are doing in Pete's memory? He, uh, he got a cancer diagnosis about five years before he died. He became macrobiotic vegan, exercising every day, gave up drugs and alcohol, blah, blah, blah. And he set up a digital download called Spirit Wrestlers. The Spirit Wrestlers were the name of a an orthodox religious sect in Russia in the... 17th century and they believed that god was with each of us and they did refuse to go to church and they just and they they induced religious fervor through music and believed that all of us were divine 
So fairly controversial, still pretty controversial now. <laughs> so the Spirit Rest, as he said, it was a digital download, and he just finished it before he died. So it's download. So he's, it's on Facebook, really. We do everything through Facebook, I have to say. There was a link, there's a new album coming out called 7,000 Possibilities of Existence, which is a kind of Buddhist concept that he made before he died with a guy from Smoke Street called Andy Riley, and there's a donation page. And we um, we basically... We put out a poster, a commemorative poster, and we, every 23rd of every month, been a cosmic number, we sort of lead to a press release every 23rd of every month. So, yeah, Spirit Restless Foundation on Facebook, if anyone wishes to donate through, through PayPal. I, I think one of the big things a lot of ravers had or have in common is this idea that like we're going to change the world or change culture through these parties we're throwing, through this music, through the togetherness, through everything. You know, like that's the idea of Plur. That was like a main piece of this whole thing that like spoken or unspoken, we all thought it, we all believed it at some point. Do you think that this culture or... DIY has changed the world in some way. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. So did it? Well, my partner often asked me that. So, you know, uh, did it change? I think it did change the world. Life is complex. There was a yin and yang with everything. Pete, who DJed as Wushu, unfortunately, passed away last year. He, he often said he, you know, he thought that we basically introduced a generation of young people into drugs. And I said, well, they're all adults, aren't they? You know, yes, a percentage of those people ended up getting into crack and heroin and possibly dying and having shit lives and possibly parenting badly. But on the positive side, it's much, much bigger. I mean, when he died, I posted it on Facebook because that's the social media for old people. It was two and a half thousand likes. We did his burial under COVID in Nottingham in October. And it was just the response was just, those people, they believe in stuff. If life is a search, not for happiness, but a search for meaning, to a generation of people, to hundreds of thousands, tentatively millions, but let's say hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people, they found a meaning for life. And it wasn't about the drugs. I think that's a mistake. I think the drugs were a vehicle for... It meant something to them. What it meant to them was community. Well, in the UK, we live in a godless society. We live in a hyper-capitalist society. We live in a throwaway society. We're destroying the planet. And I think... A lot of people are looking for something to believe in, aren't they? Yeah, been in a field in England at, seven, at dawn on a summer's day with hundreds of friends on ecstasy is a deeply spiritual experience. It's more spiritual than any church I've ever been to. You carry that with you, don't you? For those people in that space of time, it really, really meant something. And even to this day, 30 years later, people are still friends and they still have organised this and they've got kids and those kids, are, you know, and it's, you know, I think it did change the world. I think it, in the UK, football violence, football hooliganism was stopped. Lots of people took ecstasy and they couldn't, f didn't fight anymore. They all stood together on the terraces and hugged each other. It's quite funny. The police couldn't stop it, but ecstasy did. And people from all the different bits of the UK are very tribal and they are everywhere. But, you know, people from Liverpool and Manchester hugging instead of stabbing each other. And our crew, certainly in the heyday, was everywhere. They were, from, they were from projects, council estates, they were crackheads, they were black, they were white, they were brown, they were students, they were rich, they were poor, they were coke. They were, and you just don't, I've never before or since seen that mix and synthesis of people. And what people learned was everyone's okay. And some people are okay, some people aren't. And that everyone came out of their tribe. We were one tribe for quite a long time. It all fragmented and as these scenes do, as the hippie ideal did and became cliched. And I've got people living, friends living all over the world who set up businesses. And I think when we came to San Francisco, one thing we'd never seen before was that people brought food to clubs for the homeless. And it was very politicized. And we brought that back with us. A whole generation of people introduced concepts like vegetarianism and eco and land rights and lots of that stuff that has since become almost orthodox. You know, it'd be crass to say that it was just about hedonism. It was. It was just, we were just lucky to find a way of changing the world and getting wasted at the same time. And I think more than anything, it just made people realise they could organise outside of mainstream society. You don't have to do as you're told. You can do it yourself.
Rave to the Grave is recorded at the historic Newsstand Studios at Rockefeller Center in New York City. This podcast has been produced and hosted by me, Vivian Host. Our engineer is Joe Hazen. The music you hear in this episode is by Nail, Diggs and & Woosh, and other members and affiliates of the DIY sound system. Check out the other episodes of Rave to the Grave on Spotify, Apple, or wherever you get your podcasts. And for more extras and fun, find us on the web at ravetothegrave.org or on Instagram at ravetothe.grave. If you like the show, please do leave us a rating or a comment. It actually helps a lot. Thank you, ravers, for listening. And until next time, permission to party. Party.